Hello, everyone. Um, we can get started with this session. Um, welcome to this information session of job seeking in the US. My name is Pujita Venkatesh. Uh, I will be the host for this session. Uh, I graduated from CG in 2020 with a bachelor's in IT, and I'm very excited to be hosting this information session. And I really hope it adds value and uh, is useful to all the, to all of you guys. So I'll start by inter introducing the panel members we have today. And I hugely thank the panel members for spending your valuable time with, with us and uh, for helping out students. First, we have uh, Suji. Suji is a senior software development manager at Intuit and leads, in and leads Intuit's experimentation platform team. She graduated from CEG in 2009 with a bachelor's in computer science. Next, we have Krish Sivakumar, who runs the product management team for compute products at Google Cloud. Krish graduated from CG in 1991 with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Next, we have Arjun. Arjun Sharma is currently an engineering manager at Paxos and leads the ledger and settlement teams. Ledger is the source of truth for all transactions, balances for Paxos customers. The settlement team is working on a solution for crypto settlement. Settlement in the post-trade op operation of swapping of uh, digital assets and payment. Arjun graduated CEG from CEG with a bachelor's in computer science. Next, we have Harish Krishnan, who is a general manager at Amazon and graduated from CEG with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering in 2009 and did his MBA from Kenan Flagler Business School in 2015. Presently, Harish manages one of Amazon's latest uh, generation cross stock facilities, a $150 million operation with more than 60 managers and more than 22,000 employees. Welcome, panel. To start this session, I will have an icebreaker. I want uh, all, all the panel members, um, I just want to ask you what is a setback you had personally or professionally and uh, how you overcame that? This isn't, okay. Uh, I can go with Um So in fact, my setback was actually pretty much exactly at the same time that many of you are here as when I was actually graduating from my master's program in the US. Um, for those of you that uh, could recall, I have some colleagues of mine, and sorry, uh, I have some batchmates of mine. I'm sure Shanta remembers this as well. 1991, and in 1993 is when I'd actually done my master's. And 1993 was a year that uh, a major recession happened. And uh, there was a massive set of layoffs that were going on. And uh, it was just the wrong time to graduate as a newly minted graduate student, international graduate student of all, of all things. So I think um, I was a mechanical engineer in my master's and uh, was trying to kind of get a job in mechanical engineering and went to Detroit, which is... Uh, you know, the mecca of mechanical engineering jobs in the U.S. at that time. Um, the setback there was um, I had, me and another friend of mine, we had actually had a whole stack of resumes that we were, uh, had. But this is sort of, I'm aging myself, you know, this is the day of paper resumes that you had to kind of go give it to somebody and handshake. Um, we spent a week um, traveling to Detroit and spent two days in Detroit uh, trying to do this, um, we couldn't get a single person to meet with us and take our resumes in. And um, so that was a fairly large setback. Uh, you know, we were kind of full of hopes at that time, you know, hoping that we'd actually land a job. Um, fast forward, how did we overcome that? Um, part of it was perseverance. Um, just said, you know, there is a job out there for us, uh, me and my friend. And we decided to move to New Jersey. We had another friend that kind of, you know, fed us and uh, housed us for a little bit of time. And uh, we decided that we're not going to be limiting ourselves in terms of our opportunities to what we study. And, uh, you know, not limiting ourselves to what our core knowledge base was, which was in mechanical engineering. Both of us branched out and long story short, uh, ended up in jobs that were quite different from what our engineering training was and uh, the rest is history. 
Thank you, Chris. That's very really inspiring. I can go next. Um, I don't know if I would call this a setback, but every time I thought I had a plan in my career, I would either get laid off or get pregnant or get pregnant again. Um, so this this just showed me that whatever you plan, it's not going to go accordingly. You just need to take the punches and roll with it and just move on. Um, one of the things was um, when I was at Polycom, I was... I worked really hard. I became the manager. I was there for six months. And then the entire US operations got shut down. Like my director, my VP, everybody got laid off. So it was. I was sitting there and thinking, this is it. I'm not going to try again. Or I don't want to try again. And then at the time it was, again, I think recession is always there. So I think I couldn't find a job in as a manager. So I just said, okay, I'm going to go back to be an individual contributor. And if life plays out we'll come back to this and then after five years again I got to come back to the management role so um, setbacks are we just have to when we need look when you are in during the setback it feels hard but when you look back it feels okay it, it helped you grow so as long as you when you're in middle of it just things the stone will pass out and you will you know you'll grow from it I think you will come out better on the other side I can jump in next. Uh, <clears throat> I think my uh, my experience of a crucible moment is uh, similar to Christian Suji's. Uh, so when I moved to the US uh, to do my MBA, I was a non-conventional uh, or a non-traditional MBA candidate, with mechanical engineering experience and working in PSU. Uh, I remember I used to talk to my friend and he and I we used to say like, hey, we've applied to more than a hundred jobs at this point of time. And uh, each for each job, meticulously uh, curating cover letters and things like that. I used to be awake till night 2 a.m. thinking about like, hey, uh, did you like risk your entire career in hope of something, right? Uh, but the key thing is your grit. And uh, what turned out well was I got one job interview and I told, hey, this is your golden shot. Go get it. So I did not leave any stone unturned for the job interview. I went all in, did my internship. I went all in in my internship. Like I didn't care about uh, what the what was going on in the world. And uh, when I went all in at the end of that three months, I think it was a rewarding experience to get that full time offer, and then look back at the one and a half years you had invested in. Um, a blind leap of faith. I think that is very rewarding when you look back at it. I can go next. Uh, it's a pretty heavy question for an icebreaker, but uh, it's, it's, uh, I love hearing these stories. It's, it's really good. Um, very much keeping with the theme of today, I thought I'll share about uh, my um, job hunting journey while I was uh, back in Nano CCG, like in my final year. Uh, that was, I remember that as a pretty dark period. It was also like, uh, we were all younger and uh, I graduated in 2009, 2008, 2009, as uh, folks remember, was not a great time to be looking for a job either. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an eye opener for me. Like I uh, had a bunch of friends with whom we were all preparing for like interviews and so on. Uh, I always had this idea that, okay, we it, it will go well. And I had done all the preparation and so on, but it did not. So there was like repeated not, like companies I would go to, interviews I would attend and not like go get through. And uh, I was one of the uh, uh, pretty, uh, I, I got a job, but it was like pretty late in the game. I remember uh, being really stressed out for months on end uh, about this. And at that time, I didn't also have uh, enough of a maturity to know how the process works and not to take it personally, to try to treat that as like a skill set I needed to learn rather than a judgment on like myself. Uh, but it was a pretty, pretty hard thing. And that's why I'm passionate about like uh, talking about like uh, seeking jobs. And when I came to the US, I kind of had a, a playbook for how to tackle like job search. Uh, coming in, I didn't want to be at the same uh, situation I was in back uh, back home. So. Yeah, I'm passionate about this topic uh, for the reason that I have definitely had some uh, uh, scars and some experiences which I have learned from and hopefully I've grown a little bit as a result of. So. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Those were pretty great stories, and I'm sure a lot of um, students can relate to a lot of these things. Okay, I'm going to start the first question with actually a poll. I want the audience to jump in and answer this question and drop your answers in the chat box. How many minutes do you think a hiring manager spends looking at your resume? Um, we can wait for one or two minutes and then I'm gonna go and ask the first question to our panel members. Okay, we have five minutes, 30 seconds, one minute. Okay, 15 seconds, one to two minutes. Maximum of one minute. Minute. Thirty seconds. Okay, so question to the panel members. How many minutes do you actually spend on a resume? And uh, when you look at a resume, what are some things that definitely should be in there? And, uh, and how can one uh, customize a resume to the best of their ability for the role? And how long should a resume be? Um, I can start. Um, I have currently two positions open, so I'm I'm in the middle thick of this right now. Uh, how many minutes do we usually spend? If I have plenty of time, I'll spend a read through most of them. But if not, if I'm in a rush, which is most of the days, we'd spend maybe a minute or two. And there are things the, that like outright stands then we'll just ignore is if it is pages and pages long. I do not have the time to read paragraphs and paragraph of previous experience. Anything that's one page is good. It gives us that quick summary is good. And to answer your question, what is that necessary uh, things that's necessary in that resume? Your full name, your phone number, your email address, your LinkedIn profile is like the must, the basic must. And then the start with your previous, the most recent experience and then work your way down. And uh, any languages or critical skills um, that are not like common, um, that would be nice. Like if you have something like Kafka or Kubernetes or any tool that, that we are looking for, if you have those keywords right up there in that first page in all bold, that, that will help, help us. But yeah, not more than um, two minutes and there's specific red flags. Maybe uh, I, I'll jump in and kind of, uh, echo some of what Suji said. I also want to uh, differentiate between like when I'm doing initial filtering versus like when I'm actually interviewing the candidate. Uh, those are two times, two different times when we would be looking at the resume. When I'm screening candidates uh, or like a recruiter screening candidates, typically just anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute where people are trying to see if this candidate is a fit, should we like look more deeply or clearly they're not a fit and we move on to the next candidate. The reason uh, it's so short is not because we don't want to do due diligence. If I had time, like Sujita mentioned, I would love to really go deep, understand every candidate who has applied to a role or we come across, but when there are like, tons of candidates, it saves time for both the candidate and us if we can effectively filter out people who clearly don't have the skill set that I'm looking for because for most of the roles, uh, we are we have a certain specific set of skills that we have in mind and I'm trying to quickly screen and pattern match to see if that resume is something that is worth going deeper into and that part probably takes 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, though I would want to emphasize when interviewing someone, I will again revisit the resume and try to find 
uh, what work they have done. Uh, I also would echo, uh, it's very rare that someone has, even if they have a long experience, it can easily be summarized within a page. And most of the resumes I see, which are longer than that, do not warrant that that much of content. It's it's uh, it's easily summarizable to one page. So I, that that's what I would recommend. Um, I would add a, I had a couple of things. I think uh, Saji and Arjun covered most of it. Um, I'm actually going to add what not to put in. Um, so it's sort of important to think about what is something that is obvious that uh, everybody should just assume that you know. The reason not to put that is um, essentially that kind of begins to look like your resume is just being padded for words. I'll give you some examples. When I see something about Microsoft Excel in a resume, that's an instant turnoff. Because, and, and trust me, you know, a lot of a lot of resumes have them. And so, so you made a very important point, which is pick the most unique skills that you have. Uh, I think the examples that you brought up were, you know, things like Kafka and, and so on and so forth. Um, up the stack, what is it that you could actually bring in that would make you instantly productive? That's what an employer is looking for. So everything else that is sort of the basics, uh, unless it is some sort of a unique basic, don't worry about putting it there because you can actually save that space for something that's actually much more differentiated. Um, I'll add, uh, thanks, Krish. Uh, I'll just add only one thing, uh, team. I assume a lot of you are in your master's program. So uh, in this kind of a situation, uh, you might not have like uh, a plethora of work experience that you want to portray there in your resume. Uh, so I would recommend talking about projects that you have done in your master's program highlighting the skill set that the job requires. Because um, I'm, the resume review process is me finding, us finding the most suitable candidate and reducing risk. It helps me reduce risk when I know the candidate has some form of experience for the job role that I'm hiring. And especially if you're a master's candidate, your only opportunity is the projects and thesis uh, that you work on. So just don't go with one project in your master's. Try to do projects in different skills or different domains, which you can highlight in the resume. Thank you, everyone. We have uh, one question from the audience, uh, which kind of ties into this question, which is, how much influence does AI have in screening resumes? I would say a lot. So even before a resume comes to review to us, uh, it goes through algorithms where uh, the work experience, your basic skill set is reviewed. And we have um, usually the terminology varies from company to company, like a recruiting coordinator or like hiring coordinator who actually ensures the bare minimum requirements of the role is full, are fulfilled before they even shortlist and shoot a candidate list for us for interviews. So it has a significant role in like ensuring um, your resume is machine readable. Uh, that is a key thing. Um, and uh, you'll have to uh, understand that if there's a job requirement that says 10 years experience required, and minimum requirement, and then you have seven years of experience, you go apply for it, uh, invest one hour on the cover letter, there's 90% chance that that resume would not pass through to the hiring manager. One thing to add to that, Pujita, you had actually asked a question about customization of resumes earlier in the previous thing. Um, and I'm just gonna, you know, plus one on, uh, you know, Harish's answer. Um, the use of AI, even before it kind of became a cool thing, uh, has been around in text processing resumes for a very, very long time. Most application tracking systems have actually done this for decades, uh, or at least a decade. Um, it is really important for you to look at the job role and ensure that your resume is as close as possible customized to that job role. 
which means you need to essentially add relevant experience, weed out irrelevant experience, add relevant keywords, again, weed out irrelevant keywords. So a generic resume is going to get only a generic screen, but a well-customized resume, um, customization does not mean that you're going to put things that are not, are not real, but let's, you know, make sure that your resume is very closely aligned to what the job roles are and the job descriptions are. Maybe one point I would add uh, to everything folks said, I agree with. Uh, maybe one point is uh, instead of a laundry list of skill set or something like that, for any skill set that you do add, either make sure you're calling out your level of expertise there. Uh, what uh, interview process is going to have a sampling bias, right? Like we are going to just make judgment calls based on like a short interaction. So if someone asks you about one of the skill sets that you have listed and it comes across as that's not a skill set that you have, or like there is some basic knowledge about that that is missing that can negatively bias the whole interview process. So I would either call out specifically where I'm a expert versus intermediate versus I will only like have basic knowledge of a skill set. In fact, I would skip some things for which I only have a basic knowledge and highlight the skill set where I have deep knowledge. Uh, especially important for technical skills, right? Because it's very hard to, uh, uh, it's it's binary, like whether we know it or don't know it, it's somewhat easy to judge. So I would be selective and pick fewer, but make sure those are things you're comfortable talking about if asked, uh, because there is a sampling bias, whether we want it or not. People are going to make snap judgment based on like a one answer that you give. And we don't want to be in a position where one item that we listed in the resume we don't have deep expertise or like it's it's we uh, it doesn't it doesn't come across well so i would be very selective uh, but that's just my opinion so. thank you all how can a candidate make sure to get a a full-time job after a job offer after their three-month internship. I'll take that. Uh, I'll probably get started. Um, a few things. The first thing is right at the beginning of your internship, let your intention be known that uh, you are interested in pursuing, um, you know, a career with that company and, uh, your internship sponsor and sort of people that are involved in that internship really need to know your intention. Uh, so that's absolutely number one. And number two, uh, internships are a fun time, you know, absolutely have a lot of fun, but in that process also make sure that among the projects that you're involved in, think about what is that extra mile that you could actually show in terms of your delivery. Um, that's super important because um, there's a lot of things that you're going to learn and, uh, you know, showing what you've learned, showing that you could actually take that extra mile. And the third thing, I'm sure there's a lot more, but I'll kind of stop at three, is network heavily. Uh, during your internship, um, you have almost a hall pass that you could use to go ahead and then introduce yourself to anybody. And people are usually very welcome to go teach somebody because everybody likes to teach. Um, so you're in a very unique position to go ahead and then seek people and seek knowledge and uh, you know kind of engage with people that are even outside of your immediate internship round. So network very heavily. It's a very unique time that you could actually do that. And uh, both that helps in the learning process, but it also helps in making sure that you're uncovering opportunities for uh, building a career post that internship with not just your internship manager or internship team, but every other team that you can actually interact with. So plus one to all that Chris said that extra mile sets you apart, definitely. Um, and also make sure, um, find a mentor, even for the three month. Um, and if work with your manager, um, um, as you need to let them know that you are interested in that full-time job and make them, I keep asking in your one-on-ones, what is that I need to do to make sure that I have to come back? Am I meeting my expectations? Keep checking in every week 
so that you can really course correct because three months is a very short time to uh, showcase what you can do. So uh, keep checking in. The constant check in will help you course correct if they find anything that they that they that that you may be lacking. Um, but having your manager um, as your um, you know supporter and get giving you that good feedback at the end helps because the return offer at least I don't know about a lot of companies at least the ones that I've worked in depends on the feedback that you receive at the end so as long as you have checked in and you know that whatever goals you've met uh, that gives a good leg up compared to the rest of the candidates Thank you, Krishan Suji. The next question I have is, um, what is the best way to respond to salary questions when, uh, when you have to give an answer before an application is accepted? I can take a stab at it. Uh, my recommendation is don't give a number. Propose the value that you give to the firm and ask them what is the best they would give to a candidate like that, right? Um, and uh, usually, and I assume this question more is towards like, hey, I am getting uh, this question while I'm applying for the internship or the job. Uh, my recommendation is leverage Glassdoor look at what historically has been there and put the highest number you see there. Okay. Um, and the reason why I share this is um, for most companies, at least, once the candidate is fixed, uh, the salary doesn't change. It's not like uh, they choose two candidates and one candidate is annual pay is like say $10,000 extra or $15,000 extra. So they don't want to choose that candidate. It's never like that, right? So propose the value you're sharing if this is over email or phone, like say, hey, I'm from one of the top notch colleges in India. I've done these many years of experience. I've had this kind of a project and I'm sure I will add this value to your organization. What is that, that best number that you will give for me? And if it's like in writing, most companies wouldn't ask it beforehand. Leverage Glassdoor, see the max limit for a similar role in a similar company and put that. Uh, but uh, open to other uh, team suggestions as well. Uh, this is just my personal experience. One thing I would add, I agree with everything Harish said. One thing I would add is as a candidate, you are somewhat we are at a disadvantage because we don't know the salary ranges. We have less information. There's a huge information asymmetry between a candidate and the company, right? Because uh, companies have like HR departments who do market research. They know like this year, what's the comp numbers look like for a particular level. And there's a lot of uh, data that they have, which we don't have. So one answer I usually give when I'm doing job search is that I uh, uh, discuss that towards the end. Also, I want to be in a position of strength when I'm negotiating. Once you have gone through the interview process and they are ready to give you an offer, that at that stage, they are more interested in you. They have invested time and effort finding you, talking to you, finding that you are a fit for the job. To me, that is a better time for the candidate to bring up comp. One with one exception, I am upfront about a range because sometimes, especially like later in your career, you you might be completely out of the range for the role that they are. I mean, they might not be willing to pay half of what you are expecting, and that might be a waste of time for both sides. So, I do uh, am upfront about a, a range if it comes to it, or a, like uh, uh, the better way to do that is how Harish suggested: do your research, use Glassdoor, or use some other resources to find the range so that it is within what is reasonable to you. But I uh, I don't think we should lock ourselves in by like giving a specific number, especially early in the process before you have an offer or before the company is invested in you. That's, that's my two cents. Also, do not, do not be afraid to answer the question with a question. Ask them how much is the rate that you have? And you can always say, yep, that, that works for me. And we can always come back and re, uh, you know, uh, reassess the situation after the interview. So 
be be bold in saying answering that with a question you don't have you're not you nobody should force you to give you a number especially for internship and others i think they don't usually expect you to have an answer outright but as you grow in your career towards the, uh, the more senior roles you go they expect you to have a range um and so that that's where the you know level start your fi um or linkedin um just search for the positions i think in california they added this rule where they need to publish the range the base salary range that is also a good position good number to take and add what you want to more look for and provide that range always stick with the range never give an actual number thank you all um my next question is when someone is looking into switching career directions and often may not necessarily have the experience in the target industry what steps can they take to get their resume to be looked at seriously are there any trade offs they would have to make or they that they have to keep in mind while wanting to transition industries or roles i can take that um uh the one thing to keep keep in mind and by the way this happens more often than you think where people get trained in something and then they actually you know end up in a career with something else and a very common thing to do is to do bridge experiences or bridge training uh what that means is let's say you know you're very interested in a business career all of your time has been spent in engineering training you know your core engineer um if you have the means and time of course you know you can actually do a bridge as an mba or you could actually do a, a few key certificates that allow you to go ahead and then show that a you're interested in that area and b that you can actually go ahead and then you know gain the relevant experience and then sort of you know equip equip yourself for that so it is important for you to kind of have some sort of tangible bridging experience or bridging training that kind of shows that you know you're willing and able to pivot to this new thing never assume that all of the training that you've actually had in the previous career does not apply to the new pivoted thing that you're going to more often than not very high percentage of what you already have in that previous role or previous career is applicable highlight what is and if you look hard enough i'm pretty sure you'll actually find something that is you know very very applicable so you know any shift or any change is not a complete restart it's always a transition and so ensure that you're actually banking on that experience to power that transition make sure that you're doing the right bridging kind of make sure that you equip yourself for the new thing maybe one more thing i would add is uh, when looking for transitioning roles also look for opportunities where you are like if you are already working in a company and let's say you have a specific role or you want to transition to an adjacent role usually in a place where you have a proven track record in one role you are actually people are more willing to trust you and you might have also opportunities without uh, needing to uh, lock yourself down to a role by that i mean they don't need to hire you as a particular one example of this i can give is i've seen many of my uh, people in my network do this is transitioning to a product manager role while they are a engineer or engineering manager or so on for that you don't uh, you can find like someone who's doing that role who can give you that job and ask them for a chance to like try that out like you can be explicit saying this is something i'm interested in i want to try this out is there a project where i can pair up with you or pick up one small portion and uh, write a prd in the case of a pro product manager and so on uh many times people don't ask they hesitate thinking that you need to have some skill set before you actually even ask but the reality is you gain the skill set by actually trying to do the job so one one way that has worked for many of the people i've seen transition successfully is to try it out in the setup that where they are with the people with whom they are already working because there is always more work than people and there are always opportunities just lying there with no one actually uh, picking it up could be my protocol i'd actually uh, just uh, thanks for adding that arjun a huge plus one to that it's very rare you know think of this as like a 20% project right so you would simply pick that up um 
yes, it's going to add a little bit more to you know your workload, but that's a perfect way in which you can actually both learn and show that you're capable of delivering. And almost 100% of the time that the person that you're actually approaching to help out is never going to say no, because they will always appreciate the help. Again, people love to teach in general. So, you know, you gain a mentor in that process as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful input. My next question is, um, we often have applicants from varied backgrounds applying for the job. What can international students do to be more preferred? Um, I can share a few things. Um, one thing is um, there is always in perception when, when you come into masters, maybe it's at least changed or for your higher studies, right? Hey, I'm doing this uh, program that makes me capable of doing the job that I'm going to get hired into, right? So when they have uh, a pool of applicants, how do we stand out? And this is where I'll say, ask yourself the question, what are you doing out of the standard candidate pool, right? Um, and if you're not doing anything out of the standard candidate pool, you are one in a million. You're a sheep in the herd, right? If you have to stand out out of it, uh, you need to have something out of the standard pool. And that is where I would say projects, collaborate with um, your professors to work on micro projects, right? Like, hey, I made an algorithm 1% more accurate. I'll be impressed to read someone share that. Or I even uh, an algorithm to predict something or measure the efficiency or accuracy of something, right? All those projects are the ones that are going to make you stand out in your resume because you, you might be in the top 20 colleges in the US. Everyone's applying to that same job. Everyone in like in today, data science is a hot topic. Business analytics is a hot topic. AI, ML is a hot topic. But I am looking at yes, all of these have the all of these candidates have an educational background. But where is my risk less? And my risk is less with a candidate who's gone and done this. The two other things I would add is figure out what your passion is and figure out how you can marry your passion with your skill set. And I'm just giving you an example. If your passion is music and you're doing a master's in data science, see how you can work on projects that club both that will help you achieve a more exponential result that you can share. Um, and the third thing I would share is, uh, expand your network, right? Um, and this will help a lot to the previous question also when you're migrating job fields, it's really important to expand your network. And when you're having, when you're expanding your network, never ask for a job, right? You connect with someone over a period of a year, over six months, right? Have monthly one-on-ones with them. Talk to them about what you're doing, the course choices you have, um, you have a session for a resume review, everything, right? At the, on the long term, if that individual sees you fit for a role, they will definitely refer you to someone who can make that decision for you. So to summarize it, I would say, go out of the standard work, right? Outwork every one in that candidate pool marry your passion and skill set. And the third is leverage your network. You have CED alums everywhere. You have your master's alums everywhere. Go reach out to them. Like you reach out to a hundred people, maybe five will respond. But with that five, continue to connect with them. One person will end up being a genuine connection. Continue to uh, connect with them, right? Over two to three years, or sometimes over one year, when you need that role that you're waiting for and they know someone who has it, they will definitely refer you. 
Um, just to add on that, for the for when you're uh, seeking the job, when you're like uh, especially like internship, your resume gets screened out by you know hiring recruiters. They may not understand a lot, so for them numbers look really good. Um, I uh, for example, I was I did an university hiring. Um, and the recruiters looked at it and so they sent us a resume where a student said, I've contributed to this many open source projects. Um, that, that number, like anybody who reads, who's related technically or not even related to the technical, they'll read it and say, okay, this, this person has done, you know, it done the extra mile, not just the coursework, but also that, right? So to inter, especially international students put numbers that, in that it quickly gets your attention to your resume. If you even if you're a TA, say how many students did you manage? How many hours did you spend? You know, how many projects did you lead or train and be that mentor for? That numbers will quickly catch their eyes and makes you set apart in the resume portion of it. And then once you meet with them, then yeah, you want to share more. But always make sure to back your data that you're putting in resume with links and resources and artifacts. Because if you put, I've uh, open, contributed to 10 open source projects uh, and you know fixed this many bugs, sometime or the other, they're gonna ask you to sh show uh, proof for it. So just don't bluff, but uh, make sure that whatever you're doing there, it's, it's, it's reflected in your resume. I think uh, Harish and Suji had some really, really good points. Just to add a couple of them, um, one is, in every one of your experiences or projects that you quote, um, don't just write what you did. Lead with why you did it. So what was the outcome of the project that you actually you know, did? Uh, so you brought, brings up a very good point on numbers. You want to show that you're analytical. Um, and the best way to show that you're analytical is to measure yourself in everything that you did. So if you'd actually you know, do a project in your as part of your coursework, but that project is actually resulting in some kind of an outcome um, that makes something better. Lead with that. You know, this thing got better, and then you write about what you did. And so, a lot of times, you know, um, I'll be very blunt: coursework vomit doesn't help. Right? Um, everybody has done that. You know, if you took, you know, CS three hundred two, there's another you know, 300 people that took CS302. Um, but if you did a project in CS302 that had a specific analytical outcome, lead with that. And CS302 is just the background. Thank you all so much. When someone encounters uh, an unfortunate circumstance, such as getting laid off, how can um, how can they manage their visa status at such times? Do you have any tips for managing the situation? Um, I'll take this one and then definitely welcome other opinions and thoughts as well. Um, this is very real. Um, you know, I think I can I can bet that many of us know at least one person that's in an environment where. They just got laid off, and uh, their visa status is in jeopardy, and uh, they're sort of, you know, thinking through what my next steps are. Um, a few things to keep in mind: one, understand what the rules of immigration are for your particular visa category. Um, you know, there are grace periods in each one of these. You know, nothing is overnight, but you need to have a very clear picture as to you know what your grace periods are, and uh, you know, understand how much time you got to kind of do your next thing, uh, it's number one. And so make sure that you have a very clear understanding of that. Second is unlike open-ended job hunting opportunities, the pace and intensity of what you need to do in this phase is going to be very different, right? So you got to kind of throw out some of the, uh, you know, tentativeness in terms of how you approach your job search and then go all in. Right. So this is what you do, you know, day in, day out. Uh, there is no other thing that you do um, in there. Um, third is 
ensure that your finances are well secured. Because a lot of times what ends up happening is we are in a very, very anxious situation because on one side, there is a clock in terms of time that's running out in terms of visa status. And the other, you know, suddenly somebody stopped paying you. And as such, you're kind of in a very different financial situation. Um, and, and, and again, you're not alone, but, you know, recognize that that's what the reality is and plan for your finances, right? So um, that's, that's super important. And the last one is don't think that staying in a job is the only option. You know, you got to make your decision on what's important for you. You know, let's say if you're in the U.S. and you want to stay in the U.S. and if that's important, then explore options beyond a job. Perhaps you could actually do some sort of continuing education uh, in there, you know, shift your visa status to that. Uh, make sure. But if you're really serious about continuing your career, um, and let's say something doesn't happen in the US, that's not the end of the world. Um, you know, uh, quite literally, that is not the end of the world. The world is much bigger. There are plenty of opportunities that may be available elsewhere, and an opportunity to come back to the US isn't going to be, you know, closed out forever. So be open to those and, uh, you know, be able to go ahead and then flex yourself a little bit in terms of, you know, what you would do on as the next step. But just be clear in terms of what you want, because, you know, a read in the wind type of situation is actually a bad thing in this case. Um, many people that have actually founded really great startups have come from this kind of a hardship where they've kind of been pushed into a corner. And then they said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and then build some conviction for myself and go ahead and then think about something that I want to do from this crisis and out of which is born some really good technologies and really good companies. So that opportunity is always there. To um, just add uh, two things to what Chris said, uh, you should always have a plan B, right? Uh, it is not always granted your job is secure and your immigration status is secure. Um, I've worked in three different countries, right? Each country has its pros and cons, but you should always have a plan B if you're not in your home country. Uh, and let that be anywhere in the world because what you should rely on should not be the immigration status or the company that you work for, but your talent. If you are talented, you will end up at your final destination some way or the other. But you should invest on that talent, your skill set, right? A company will hire you and send you to Luxembourg if you have an immigration issue. Company will send you to Australia, India, and get you back to the US if they need you, right? So your talent and what you do at your work is your biggest strength. And understand that you can overcome the immigration situation, the layoff, everything, if you are... 100% sure on, hey, this is my talent. This is what I've done. This is my strength. The world needs this strength and I'm going to deliver it, right? And the reason why I say the plan B, um, in my life, I had um, certain crucible immigration situations, but I always had a plan B. Um, when my US immigration was at risk, I had my Canadian PR lined up. So I could make a switch when Amazon said like, hey, we can support you in Canada. Within two weeks, I was able to relocate to Canada. And similarly, when I was moving back to the US, I did not rely just on an Amazon job. I always had my opportunities open. I had a plan B say, hey, I moved to US. I don't like the role that I'm transitioning into. What should I do, right? So always invest in that plan B. Most of the times, the moment we get an offer letter or we get a confirmation, we just forget our plan B, right? So you should always have that when you're not in your home country. And your home country can change from time to time, right? So you shouldn't be worried about that, but this should always be in your mind. Plus one to everything Harish and Kish said, uh, I, like, all of that resonated with me. Plus I want to emphasize, I think, especially coming from India, like a lot of us have this 
idea of growing up, seeing our parents' generation and so on, that jobs are really some kind of stable things where you have one job throughout your life and things are always stable. That is a very uh, different worldview from where we are today, right? In US, in a hyper-capitalist society, like uh, uh, recessions and uh, layoffs are part of the cycle. It is going to be there. All of us will uh, run into it at one point or the other. So uh, plus one to Harish's point about anticipate things like this happening at some point so that you don't freak out if it happens. You have a plan for how would you handle that even before you get yourself into a situation. One point that maybe I also want to emphasize is uh, invest into your own mental health. It's really important that you have a really strong core when you're facing challenges like this because it will be thrown at, you will be thrown into such situation whether we choose to or not. Uh, I have seen some people spiral into really dark places when faced with these challenges. So instead, remind yourself you have faced a lot of challenges and got into where you are. So it's not an uh, easy paved path. So you will, this too shall pass. And kind of reminding yourself of that, having your own way of dealing with the stress of the situation, at the same time, not getting paralyzed and taking action for what is next, especially when you have these uh, visa timelines and things like that. It always looks in the moment to be very scary. Uh, but always there is a lot of support. If you reach out for uh, support, there are people to help you and there are resources. Uh, remind yourself of that and uh, also take care of your mental health. So on that point, when you're reaching out, first line, say that I am. I have a clock that's running. Most probably than not, anybody when, especially if you, if I've been, if I am in HNV, I see somebody that's, that's the clock is running out, I am going to refer them. I'm going to stop what I'm going to do. I'm going to refer them. So as Harish said, if you apply to 100 people and at least five people apply, refer to you, you get better chance. Like if it is one among the 10, 100 cold, cold you know, messages in LinkedIn, it's I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have the time to do all of them. But if somebody says, hey, I, I'm going to run out of this. I This is how much days I need. Can you help me? Regardless if they're from CEG or not, I'm going to refer them. I'm going to get them that help, right? So always... Don't feel bad that layoffs happen to everybody. I think everybody who has who is at one sort of other has had laid off once. So um, so if it's not like a bad thing, it does not reflect poorly on you or anything. So it's just the situation as it is. So broadcast that and say, put it in LinkedIn, reach out to everybody, reach out to your all the network that you have done and say, I need your help. Get me this help, get it for me here. And when you do that, please make sure you send the exact code, exact job link and write resumes to our refer. That is very crude. A lot of people send me urgent messages, but when you read the messages, the job code does not match what the resume is. Even then we'll refer them, but you want to be more successful. So spend the time. That should be the only thing that you're looking for. That, that should be the only thing that you're focused on. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, Ji, referencing, referencing to your point of um, referrals, my next question is about that. Um, how can one pick the best person to refer them for a job application? What are some things that they should keep in mind um, while asking for referrals or picking someone for referring them? So I can um, I can ref answer that. So uh, uh, go find a job in LinkedIn. Uh, this is how I used. I think everybody has their own set of steps that they do. Um, go find the job in LinkedIn. It um, And then on the side, it just usually says from your connections, the first, second, third connections who are all working in that company. I usually start with the first level connections because when you refer, uh, message them, give them the job link, LinkedIn link and the job ID and send them message saying, this is my resume, please refer me to this. And more often than not, people are interested in referring you because we get referral bonus. It's not like a just to do good thing. It's it's win-win situation when you get hired. So people will refer as long as you help them get them the thing. So first connections, people who are working in the company, most of the majority of the companies have good referral bonus. So that's one incentive. Uh, if you don't have a first connection working in that company, go to your second level. Um, and so that is being a friend of a friend or a connection of a connection. You can reach out to them because some may be open. You can send them a message in LinkedIn. Some you may, they may not, uh, you may not be able to message them. Then you loop through them. Um, another thing is the, 
uh, recruiters itself, sometimes they put their email and contact details as well. You can directly call, message them as well and say, hey, I want to be referred. Um, your alumni network, Sigana, has places people work in. So you can go to sigana.org and see who's working there and find them. They may not be in your LinkedIn, but it doesn't matter. Find them, go find, connect them in LinkedIn or find, even message in Sigana and find the, ask them to refer you. So there are multiple ways that you can go to that first connection who can refer you directly to the company. One thing I would also add to the list that Suji said was uh, if you have someone who has worked with you who can kind of speak to the exact work that you did, that would be very powerful because when we are filling out a referral or something, we adding the context of, hey, I have actually worked with this person and like on this project and this is how we performed is way more stronger than if it was like a, someone just reached out to me and this is the uh, referral. Um, so find people you have worked with. If you can find people in your network, uh, that is very compelling and uh, could actually be valuable. So. Quickly adding one more thing to what Suji and Arjun said. Um, in your LinkedIn, make sure that if there are people that are willing to recommend you, reach out to them and then make that a record of your LinkedIn profile. Um, that's an important thing because that shows the weight of all your claims that you've actually made in the rest of your profile and in your resume, because there is now somebody that's coming in to vouch for you independently on what it is. So um, that's a good hobby to have where you actually reach out to people even without you know an active job search to solicit recommendations and record those recommendations. So over time, you kind of build a small portfolio of good weighty recommendations. Thank you all. Thank you so much. When a candidate has a couple of job uh, offers, um, how can they narrow down to that final decision of picking a job offer? What are some things that they should consider to pick the best offer? Um, I, I'd start. Um, leaving financials aside for a second, you know, you don't always gravitate to the highest paying job. Um, you know, it's sort of a hard decision, but it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, Harish said something earlier that I want to kind of requote, which is find what speaks to your passion. So one of these jobs is going to really speak to your passion where you would think that not as, is not just professionally fulfilling, but personally fulfilling. Think back about the interview process and the people that you interacted with, which among the set of people that you interacted with in those two opportunities would you like to be around where you could actually learn? And that actually makes a huge difference um, as well in terms of you know, what you do, because it is not just a job that you do, it's what you do with the people around you. So if you feel strongly that you know there is one set of people that you think we could actually do your best work with, um, those would be kind of the criteria that you'd wanna use. Um, if I may add one thing I also look for mm -hmm. is how does this add to my next job or something like that? Right? What skill set will I learn on this job and how does it pave the road for my next uh, job? Especially as you gain skill set, as you uh, start gaining some experience and specializing in certain domain or something, you might then want to think about like what is your next five years look like? Where are you headed and what skill set do you need that you can learn on the job and what jobs will uh, expose you to opportunities for learning those skill set and uh, uh, it could be like a specific domain you want to explore or it could be related to a product area it could be a, a, a industry or it could be related to a role transition or something right if you are looking to transition between roles whatever your next job is how does this job uh, act as a stepping stone towards that is also a, a good uh, thing to think about especially mm -hmm. early in um, so for me, uh, this is personally my list. Um, when you're interviewing, um, the, the, they're not just looking for a candidate, you're also looking for a company. So if you walk away from the interview th not having a good feeling about the team or about the manager or about the company culture, even if the pay is high, you might want to walk away because in long term, it will hurt 
us. So um, if I walk away thinking, wow, that person uh, that I just interviewed, even though it's just completely tanked it, but it was a great experience talking to them, I would be, I would prefer to work with them, um, right? So um, always, um, I don't know if this is a good thing to show, but you should you you should not be the smartest person in the room. If that is, then you're not in the right team or the right place. So um, that's where when you're interviewing, they ask, what questions do you have? Use that time to uh, gauge, is that, a, is that a good fit for you to stay? Um, even no matter how desperate our situation is, you want to make sure that you are going to a right team and the right company with the right culture. Um, so that's that's something that I want to add. Well, just I know there was a lot of questions in the chat as well. How are we doing on time? Yes, thank you. I was just going to bring that up. I will ask one more question after which we'll dive to the Q and A from the audience, and we can do that until five thirty. Uh, sorry, six thirty, and then we can wrap up. Is that that's okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay. So my last question is, um, what are some pros and cons of follow-up communications once an application has been made? Submitted, sorry. Um, pro is definitely if uh, you reached out to referral and we didn't do it yet, the reminder helps. We'll refer, make sure that uh, you're good. Um, or if it, you're already referred and you're not getting any response back, um, some companies, they do get a note to the referrer and say, here's where the process is. Either they yes or no. Some companies, they don't. So it depends on where. Um, but sending that reminder to that person, be respectful because they're doing you a favor. Right? Be respectful and ask them, hey, I did this. Yeah, just put the information again, like, uh, in the, your email uh, email address and probably your resume again and the list again and say, um, I'm just following up. Did you hear anything from the recruiter or something like that would definitely help and go a long way. Um, but reminders always help. Um, nobody's going to say, oh, this person sent me 10 reminders, so I'm not going to do or help them. Everybody's right, willing to help. So reminders help. Thank you, Suji. Okay, so thank you everyone um, for the question, for the answers. And now we can dive to Q and Q &A from the audience. Uh, so let me try to pull up. I'm trying to pull up questions from the audience. If everyone, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box right now. Okay, one person has asked um, to me in private chat if uh, how important is uh, the ranking of the school that they went to? Uh, does it really matter? And uh, while getting shortlisted for a job, how good of a school that they went to? Maybe I can take a stab at this. Firstly, if you have, if this is something where you are thinking about before you join a school, then it's a valid thing to think about. If you already have a certain profile, you have the profile that you have. I won't worry about like, is that the best profile for every job? Because these are facts about our profile that we, it's either hard to change or uh, more importantly, like uh, I think most of us are in tech and I think the audience is also heavily tech based. Pedigree is not valued that heavy, uh, heavily in tech compared to a lot of other industries. And uh, what skill set you bring to the table and demonstrable like ability to exercise those skill set is valued way more. And there are a lot of ways of showcasing that, uh, including uh, calling back to like that ways that Harish gave about your side project. Uh, like there are so many ways of doing that to, especially today with all the resources you have online. So I wouldn't, over index on because this is one of those things you cannot change you got masters from some school do schools matter when sure when someone is looking at resumes for the first time if a school is more flashier like uh, like one of the top three schools in the us versus something i have not heard about that might actually catch my attention sure and might positively bias me towards that candidate but that is a initial impression at the end of the day we are still going to go through the interview process how they are going to perform in those 
uh, uh, specific set of rounds is what is going to determine. So the minor edge someone might have because of their pedigree, I would not over index on that. Sure, if you are still applying to colleges or if you are in that phase, try to find like the best college you can go to. There's nothing wrong in that. But I wouldn't worry too much about that being a disadvantage or that affecting your career going forward, right? The opposite is also true. Just because you went to a very high pedigree college does not guarantee anything about your future prospects. You still have to work at it. You just have better uh, uh, networking opportunities. You have a better network and you just uh, hopefully learned more skill set in like a environment that forced you to like exercise those skill sets. And just to plus one on what Arjun shared, I've seen some of the best leaders come out of like a rank 20 school. Like, and I've seen some of the worst leaders come out of like MIT, Harvard, or UMich Ross, and places like that. So, the pedigree is gets you a foot into the door, but what you are is what actually matters. And especially in today's world, uh, people uh, look at what you can deliver more than pedigree. The one thing that I would add is it's not part of the question, but sort of related to the question, which is leverage your pedigree. So every single college, no matter whether it's highly ranked, lowly ranked, not ranked, it doesn't matter. You will know somebody that is the alumni of your institution that's actually doing a role somewhere that you would be interested in. And you automatically have that connection have, having been to that same college that they were in just like how all of us in this call are, right? So we share a common pedigree that has actually brought us together. So leverage that, but not worry about it. Thank you, everyone. We have a question from um, Rahul, which is, how does the data analytics and data science career or look like for the next 10 to 20 years? That's an interesting question. Uh, it's a crystal ball question, Rahul. It's uh, you know super hard to answer that. I'll tell you this. November or October of 2022, nobody expected the explosion that we're actually seeing with large language models in AI, as we're seeing within a matter of 12 months. So this, we're all living in an industry that actually changes pretty rapidly. But that, having said that, there are a few foundational skills that are extremely relevant in the long run, and data science is certainly one of them. Um, it We are living in a world of information that's only exploding in so many different ways. And to the extent that we actually build the skills that allow us to go ahead and then um, you know, learn how to manage uh, data in a very generic sense uh, is always gonna be helpful. Um, the important thing that I would state is it's not what you learn, it's how you apply it. And how you apply it will change over a long period, like two decades that you talked about. So keep looking at ways in which that application of the skill that you got in data science and how you're going to go ahead and then have that continuously change. I think Arjun made a very important point. The job that you select really needs to be a stepping stone for the next job that you want to do. So think about the application of the skill that you have with data science. It's an absolutely fantastic uh, skill to have, not just today, but it's not just having that skill as sort of some sort of a golden ticket uh, for you know a 10 to 20 year eternity in great jobs. It's really how you apply it daily. So to that, one thing I would add is also don't try to chase the flavor of the month. There's always going to be like newer trends. Like I remember five years back, ML was, everyone wanted to be ML engineer and everyone's resume said like ML engineer and so on. So go for it, go learn it. If that is an area that's of interest to you and kind of go deep and try to uh, learn, but uh, uh, make sure you're not just chasing because the trends will keep changing. There'll be now LLMs and AI is like, the current wave, but uh, what ultimately you need to make uh, some investment of your time, learn something deeply, and that is never going to go waste. Like, uh, so I won't worry so much about like uh, what is the current trend and so on, but what is how does that add to your profile? What is the uh, uh, what is the next steps there? And there's always so much to learn and 
especially in tech, we are never going to be like reach a point where it's okay for us to uh, just uh, uh, relax or not keep up with what is next. It's always going to keep changing. Thank you, everyone. We have um, a question that two candidates asked, actually. Um, I think it was Preeta and someone else uh, along the lines of not having prior work experience. And thank you, Suji, for answering that in the chat box. But, but I just wanted to kind of pitch the question here. Does not having work experience when applying for internships or full-time um, job opportunities, um, is that... is, is are the folks who have work experience at a at a position of advantage compared to the ones who don't? I'll uh, take a stab at it and then like I'll let everyone else um, add their thoughts. So um, first of all, if it's an internship, 99% of the time, we are looking for a candidate or we understand that the candidate does not have work experience and is fresh in their program of their master's or their bachelor's, right? So for an internship, it doesn't specifically put you at a disadvantage. But what puts you at a disadvantage is you not having something that stands out in your resume because everyone applies to the job openings that are there. And higher or well-ranked companies get more and more of those applications. So ensure you add something that showcases or reduces the risk in hiring you for your internship. If this is for a full-time fresh role, most of the companies would be very clear about what the job uh, work experience requirement is, right? So do not try to target a role that requires 10 years of work experience. Definitely, it might put you at a disadvantage. But if there is something which says three years of work experience and you're coming fresh out of college, you should be able to navigate your way into that role. It wouldn't put you at a disadvantage. But the key thing is, what have you done above and beyond just your master's is what matters. And remember, with your master's, every one of you probably have a thesis. So every candidate applying has something that they can talk about their master's thesis project or their final project. But beyond that, you need to articulate the scope of what you can deliver, which gives me confidence that if I hire this candidate, I am getting, a, I'm reducing my risk in the decision that I'm making when I see like, hey, this individual has done X, Y, and Z projects. So I think that's my overarching guidance in terms of if you think you're at a disadvantage, I don't think you are at, but you need to improve your probability. Yeah, absolutely agree with what Suji wrote and what Harish just said is one thing to add to that is a lot of times you're just going through your master's program um, and you're either in the process of selecting your master's project or thesis, you're kind of working with your advisor. One criteria for you to think about very clear, carefully is, are there ways in which you could actually take your master's project or thesis and make that commercially viable? So when you go talk to your advisor about the project or thesis that you're going to research on, talk to them very specifically about commercial viability and a set of companies that would be willing to sponsor your project or thesis. You get two outcomes out of that. Outcome number one, you get RA money, that's important. And uh, so, you know, an assistantship is never a bad thing. So that as a company that's actually gonna pay you, it's not coming out of the university's budget, you know, good sailing. Number two is you have an instant industry connection where you're actually building something or working on something that this company is gonna provide active feedback. They got money in this, trust me, they're interested in providing feedback. So you could build on that and that, instantly counts as work experience, even though you're actually doing a part of your coursework. Thank you, thank you so much. We have another question um, that uh, that is, how effective is cold emailing, messaging hiring managers on LinkedIn? 
Does that help to mitigate issues in eight years? What does ATS mean? I'm not sure. Application tracking systems. So this is Resumix and all the other AI-based application tracking systems. All right. Thank you. I'm so assuming that's what the uh, questioner meant. So I don't want to kind of make up make up that. Um, I'll just share cold emailing on LinkedIn uh, works if the individual you're reaching out to is active on LinkedIn, right? If you and I want you to put your eggs or your efforts where you find an app. If you see someone who's really active on LinkedIn and you cold email them, there is more probability they will um, respond to you. Uh, so it works, right? Uh, your next best alternative is your uh, alumni associations, right? If you reach out to me through your alumni association reference, I'm going to definitely respond, right? Um, it's because someone in my past helped me get to where I am. I want to help someone else, right? Uh, it is how we build ourselves as such a big uh, institute where we have been able to help people with good talent grow, right? Uh, so cold emailing helps, but just ensure you're putting your effort in the right place. If you go cold email someone who's not even your alumni, who you have no close response on, your probability is lower. You will, you will have some one-off stories, right? There'll be like a magical cold call that got someone a job and things like that. But before going to that, I would say, invest on people who you're more, you have lesser number of connections to. The one thing that I would add, sorry, can I just finish, finish it up? I said closer connections to. Yeah, uh, plus one to that. One, uh, one specific thing that I would add to that is, when you're emailing somebody, your intent cannot be transactional. Your intent should be relational. So, Ensure that you're really not doing something opportunistic just to kind of get a transaction through with them, you know, a referral or, you know, some sort of a connection establishment or whatever it is. Um, your intent really should be, hey, I respect this person for what they are and what they can do for me. I would like to build a relationship. And within that relationship, there will be a transaction for sure. But don't just approach them as, you know, I'm going to get to know you overnight. And then once I kind of, you know, fulfill this transaction, I don't really care about you anymore. Right? So that kind of comes up across really harsh for people that uh, are looking to respond to you. But when you approach them with a relationship mindset, they're a lot more open to kind of go through the transaction that you want them to do. True. And I'll just add one thing, probably this will serve as a guidance for everyone who's in their master's you should be reaching out to people even before you board your flight to US, right? You cannot, if you're at this uh, phase where you're searching for a job or an internship, and then you're reaching out, you have lost that golden opportunity to connect with your master's college alumni, your workplace alumni, or your CEG alumni. You should reach out the day you decide like, hey, I'm going to go do a master's. That's when your job search starts. That's when your relationship building starts. I have been in touch with a few CEG alumni who I just reached out to them and they were just model support for my uh, job search process um, or through my master's. I didn't, e I didn't even ask them a job. They just like uh, get in touch with me once in three months. We have a nice chat. Uh, sometimes I've been invited to dinner to their place and uh, there, there's no transaction as Krish uh, said, uh, but we stay in touch, right? Those are the relationships you should have. And when you're in a dire situation or when the time is apt, uh, things will turn out well, right? Like for all you know, that person might reach out to a job to you as well, right? It's, it's both ways these mentorship relationships are. So uh, leverage that opportunity holistically.
Thank you. I think I'll, I'll take the last question, which is, um, do, do you have any insights about the forthcoming changes in the H-1B slash lottery? Uh, I think I, I'm not qualified to answer that question uh, because I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I think there are plenty of resources uh, online that has bulletins that are being shared. Um, so I have no, I have no idea. Uh, and I'll share this. I don't think you should worry about your H-1B lottery. This is the reason I'm sharing it through your masters, focus on what is going to be your biggest strength. If a company finds you as the right fit, I've had a few of my friends, the company has on day one moved them to Ireland, had them work over there for a year. And when the time was apt, when they got their lottery in, brought them back to the US. Same, move people to Luxembourg, hire them under their European division, right? So they're, the H-1B is not the end of your life, right? It's just a pathway to a more reliable job market. But your talent is what will get you where you need to go. So focus on that. I'm sure there are a thousand and one ways to navigate uh, your H-1B concerns. Uh, but I do want to, I do see like there's a small post about this hiring freeze and economy situation over here. Uh, holistically, I want to share one thing, right? There will always be an uncertainty in economy. There might be a full-scale recession. There might be a small-scale industry-based recession, right? I think Suji, uh, Arjun, Krish, all of them shared that some form of this will impact us. So the better your candidacy is, the stronger your opportunity of finding a job will be, right? That is the point blank truth. And that's where what Chris said about passion, right? If you're passionate about something, if it's closely related to an industry, it, it goes a long way because you will have exponential satisfaction on what you do. You will be more successful on the research that you do, the work you do, and that will create avenues of opportunities for you. So, uh, economy will like go up and down, right? Like Fed is holding the interest rate. It is an indicator that like there might be some uncertainty, but go ahead, be the best candidate. It's not like there's not going to be one job opening. There is going to be one open. And when that opening comes, you have to be the best candidate for it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um... I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap the session up. Uh, thank you again all for participating and thank you to the lovely panel members for uh, for being a part of the panel and for, share, for sharing all your valuable insights. I uh, hugely appreciate it. And uh, I apologize, I was a little sick today. So uh, I just just about managed, but, uh, but thank you so much. Um, and uh, a request for all the audience, please, uh, Please uh, register in Sigana as a as a member. So you can go to sigana.org and become a member and uh, you will get all the email updates and please join the LinkedIn group as well. And uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm very happy and uh, happy to have organized this session. And I had a really lo lovely time listening to all the great inputs and I'm sure the audience would have found it super useful. Thank you once again. I have to say this on behalf of all the panelists. I'm sure all of us feel this way. We all know that you don't just do this as a public service and you're super passionate about this particular area. So huge thank you for organizing organizing us and organizing this uh, uh, this this panel in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye.